Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. We left off last time, near the end of what's called the Troublesome Voyage of John Hawkins. The English fleet under John Hawkins had gone through a terrible hurricane. Promised safe passage by the Spanish, the Spanish wound up a train and attacking them. A terrible battle ensued, and Francis Drake, captain of one of the ships, was told to put as many men and as many goods on board and sail away from the battle. The only other ship that made it out carried on board the admiral of the fleet, John Hawkins himself. After the battle, John Hawkins was unable to find Francis Drake. He was nowhere to be seen, so John Hawkins headed back to England. It was a long and painful voyage for him. His ship was in very poor repair, and the men on board not much better. They had been through both a hurricane and a battle, many of them were injured, and before long, all of them were going hungry, some of them even starving. The winds weren't in their favor, and the voyage took longer than it should have. When they were finally able to reach a port where they could resupply, some of the men ate so much that they became ill, even a few of them dying. This is a thing that does happen. Back in World War II, many Allied soldiers were given orders only to give concentration camp victims of camps that they had liberated a little bit of water and a little bit of broth. Giving them any solid food could be hazardous to their health after so long a time without sufficient food. So some of the men on board died from overeating, and they were just ignominiously thrown into the sea. When they finally reached Europe, they were forced to land in a Spanish port. This must have stung after having been attacked by the Spanish in what they saw as a dire betrayal. However, the Spanish gave the English ships some repairs and a few sailors to sail them back to England. When John Hawkins reached England as quickly as possible, he learned that Francis Drake had landed in Plymouth only a few days before. The Spanish sailors were sent back home, and an English crew was brought on board to take John Hawkins' ship to Plymouth. There he met his brother, the elder Hawkins, named William, who told him that he had sent Francis Drake on to meet with the Queen and give a report of what had happened in the Caribbean. John Hawkins saw Francis Drake leaving the Caribbean as a betrayal. However, Francis Drake contended that the orders had been unclear. He was only told to leave the battle and not told where to meet up with the fleet later. He had seen his responsibility to get his men and as many of the goods as possible back to England safely, and he did so. Back in London, John Hawkins had three goals. One was to see the name of Francis Drake dragged through the mud. Two was to petition the Queen for letters of mark or reprisal against the Spanish, which he was going to go on the offensive against. And third was to petition the Spanish themselves for the release of the English sailors they had in captivity. This led to John Hawkins being drawn into a world of political intrigue that he didn't really want to be dragged into. However, Elizabeth and the Crown had its own priorities and its own goals, and it was going to use John Hawkins to secure these goals. This is a story that's going to lead to some of the greatest military and political achievements of Elizabeth's reign. However, we're going to wait on this story. For now, we're going to stay with Captain Francis Drake. His focus has shifted from harassing the Spanish and trying to disrupt their trade to seeking revenge against them, something amounting to almost all-out war, in an event that has been called by historians Drake's War. This is episode number eight, The Treasure House of the World. After his meeting with the Queen, Francis Drake disappears from history for a little while. It's possible that he was briefly imprisoned on the testimony of John Hawkins for having abandoned the voyage. If he was not imprisoned, then it still might have proved a smart move to get out of England for a while until the heat died down. There is some evidence that Francis Drake went on a couple of legitimate and pretty small trading voyages, either to Africa or back to the Caribbean. The next official record that we have of Francis Drake appears when he got married. Now this raises some questions, because the voyage of John Hawkins was seen to be and recorded as a financial failure. However, for the young Francis Drake to have raised enough money to support a young wife and potentially a family, he must have had some money put away from somewhere. And she was going to need a little bit of cash to live on, something of a nest egg, because Francis Drake was soon to go on his next voyage to the Caribbean. <laughs> 
Three ships left Plymouth on November 25th, 1569. All three were owned by the elder Hawkins' brother, William, and one of them was actually captained by William Hawkins. The three ships sailed to Africa, where they traded some legitimate goods. There was no slaving on this voyage, just some English goods for African goods. Then the ship of William Hawkins sailed back to England, while the other two ships, the Swan and the Dragon, sailed west, across the Atlantic, back to the Caribbean. This voyage wasn't tremendously eventful. Drake didn't keep any official record of it, and the Spanish records of the time record no English abuses in the Caribbean. At least, none that mention specifically Francis Drake or any ship belonging to the Hawkins brothers. There were records of attacks by Luteranos Corserios, but it's thought that these were probably French Huguenot pirates. The Spanish would have made mention of it if it were Francis Drake. This may have been just another simple trading voyage. Or it may have been, for Francis Drake, a reconnaissance voyage, a voyage where he intended to learn as much as he could for his coming plans. He harbored a lot of ill will against the Spanish, sometimes outright rage or hatred for what they had done to him and the voyage of John Hawkins, and he intended to see that they paid for it. If this wasn't intended to be a voyage of reconnaissance, for Drake to learn as much as possible, well, that information was dropped in his lap nonetheless. The Spanish had organized a defense against pirates in the region, both French and English pirates. The Spanish had begun a system of naval convoys that would accompany any Spanish merchant ships traveling around the Caribbean. These were heavily gunned ships that would deter any pirates in the region hoping to take these Spanish merchant vessels. If Francis Drake had intended a little piracy against some Spanish ships while on this voyage, he would quickly have realized that he had no hope of success against this convoy system. At first, the French pirates in the region had the same problem, but quickly they learned to adapt and evolve to the situation. While even the best of these French pirate ships couldn't hope to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these Spanish warships, they were just hopelessly outgunned, they decided to use a different tactic. They just attacked using rowboats. They had what was called the mothership, the primary pirate vessel, but they usually towed, or sometimes manned, two or three smaller vessels. Vessels that weren't suited for long-range sea travel, but in the Caribbean Sea, they were small, they were fast, and they had a shallow draft, so along the coast they could get into certain inlets and rivers that larger vessels would be unable to. Most of these ships had a single sail, but they also came equipped with oars so that they could move very quickly and despite the wind. They usually had a single cannon at the fore. Now, of course, a small vessel with a single cannon couldn't hope to stand up against a Spanish warship, but this wasn't intended for long, drawn-out sea battle. It took time for a ship at sea to move into position to fire on another ship, and these small rowboats could move in quickly, get alongside a ship, and board her. They were bristling with men, armed with muskets, swords, pikes, and axes. They could sneak in alongside a larger vessel and board her before any of their crew realized what was happening. If they did so at night when most of the crew was sleeping, they could subdue the ship within minutes. At that point, they could loot the ship of any valuables they thought worth taking, get back on their smaller vessel, and sail away before any of the Spanish ships could respond. Even if these Spanish warships gave chase, they were nowhere near as fast as these smaller craft. They had the element of surprise and stealth. Sometimes, if they were lucky, they were able to loot the ship and be away before any of the other ships in the convoy knew that anything was happening. This was proving extremely successful for the French pirates. And once Francis Drake saw just how successful they were, he wanted in. It's even possible that on this reconnaissance voyage, Francis Drake took part in some of this French piracy. There's no record of it, but we do know that he did know quite a few of the French pirates operating in the region, so he might have seen firsthand just how successful these smaller craft were at taking larger prizes. But we do know that after this voyage, he rushed back to Plymouth in England, and he commissioned two of these smaller ships to be constructed. They were disassembled and put aboard his ship the Swan. Then he sailed back to the New World in the year 1571. It was around this time that the Spanish published a list of the most notorious English pirates. Most of these pirates are people that we've talked about so far. The Winter brothers topped the list. George and William Winter were, while well, naval officials in England, seen as notorious pirates to the Spanish. 
The Hawkins brothers, of course, were on there as well. William and John Hawkins came next. Francis Drake and his brothers filled out the rest of the list, along with a few other pirates. However, this 1571 voyage began a plan that would see Francis Drake's name begin to rise. He would move past his brothers, past William and John Hawkins, even past the Winter Brothers, to become the most notorious pirate in the Caribbean and Spain's most wanted criminal. One of Drake's first actions upon returning to the Caribbean was to join a group of French pirates who were operating on the Caribbean coast of modern-day Panama. It was called then Terra Firma. This kind of lends credence to the theory that Drake was operating with the pirates on his previous voyage, but now we have confirmation of it. The French were not alone, however. They were in contact with a large group of escaped slaves, known collectively as the Cimarrones. Today, they're called the Cimarrones, but the original English documents refer to them as Cimarrones, and I'm going to use that terminology. If that's somehow a slur or derogatory, I'm unaware of it, and I don't mean to offend anybody. I'm just going off the pronunciation and the original historical English documents, so my apologies ahead of time if my ignorance offends anybody. The Cameroons were a thorn in the side of the Spanish. They were building communities all throughout the Spanish New World that launched attacks on the Spanish, raiding and harassing them, and also offering safe haven to any escaped slaves. They were in contact with many of the natives of the area who also didn't like the Spanish in their lands, so they were able to work together. The Bishop of Panama around this time complained of the Cameroons, quote, The human tongue cannot relate the ignominies which both the French and the Cimarrones have this year inflicted here on all sorts of persons. And of a thousand Negroes who arrive annually, three hundred or more escape into the wilds. End quote. These were men and women who had been brought forcefully into the Spanish colonies, and then allowed to roam, well, not freely, obviously, they were property, but allowed to roam all throughout their colonies, learning the day-to-day -day activities of the Spanish, both their merchant activities and their military activities. They knew the ins and outs of the Spanish New World better than anybody else, and so they proved a powerful ally to the French pirates. And these French pirates were the first to introduce Francis Drake to the Cameroons. Now, despite his first few voyages to the Caribbean, being on board vessels that were accompanying slaving vessels, such as the Jesus of Lubbock, Francis Drake didn't look down on these escaped slaves. In fact, in many ways, he really respected them. They had escaped the clutches of the Spanish and built something truly impressive, and they were undeniably powerful allies. This must have been something of a strange meeting. The English, historically speaking, hated the French. And the French hated the English. They were ancient enemies. These escaped slaves must have had reason to mistrust and hate any white people that they came in contact with. However, they were meeting to ally together for a common cause. They had two basic things in common, though. First of all, all of the members of these three groups were rebels who were operating outside of the law of their respective kingdoms and monarchs. Now, while the Cameroons had no monarch, they were African slaves, they had previously belonged to Spanish overlords, and they were definitely operating outside of the Spanish law in the New World. These French pirates were Huguenot rebels who were in civil war against the French crown. And while Francis Drake was a hugely patriotic man who loved Queen Elizabeth, this was not an official naval royal voyage. This was a personal vendetta that he was seeing followed through. And secondly, most importantly to this meeting, all three of these groups desperately hated the Spanish. The three groups joined forces. Drake had his two brand new vessels, which were manned by both his Englishmen and several French pirates. The Cameroons sent the help of a man who was to guide them, a man who knew the area extremely well named Pedro Mandinga. He was going to lead them secretly and quietly up the rivers of Panama to reach the Spanish settlements there. Their plan was to row a small galley up the Rio Carges. The Rio Carges was an extremely important river. It still is today. It's the basis for the modern Panama Canal. It translates into English as the Cargo River, and it was the connection between the Caribbean Sea in the north and the Gulf of Panama in the south. Where it met the Gulf of Panama was a small town called Panama, 
This is today Panama City, the capital of the nation. This town of Panama was where all of the goods from the former Inca Empire, that is modern-day Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, they were all shipped to Panama. These were goods such as furs and spices and pearls and dyes, extremely valuable. These were then shipped overland, usually by mule train, over mountains and through jungles and swamps to get to a town in the north called Nombre de Dios. Now twice a year, they were not shipping furs and spices and dyes. At particular times, twice a year, they would ship all of the minted gold and silver from Spanish South America to the town of Panama to go by mule train over land to Nombre de Dios. However, this time of year, when Drake and his companions were on their voyage, was not that time of year. This was the dry season. That was a time of year when any vessels on the Rio Cargase were forced to wait. They had to wait for the rainy season before they could continue their voyage and drop off or pick up their goods at any of the warehouses along the river. Now, these were all larger river vessels, larger vessels than Francis Drake's small galley, which could move freely along the river at this time of year. While these ships waited haplessly, Drake and the men with him would row up alongside, board the ship, and steal everything they could carry. Really, anything they could carry. Much more than they could hope to carry on their small vessel. But they destroyed, threw away, or burned anything that they didn't think was worth keeping. This wasn't just to enrich Drake and the other pirates. It was to destroy Spanish goods in a large quantity. It's estimated that during this time, on this raiding voyage, Drake and the other pirates stole more than 50,000 pesos worth of goods. This voyage took only a few days. They stole a whole lot of Spanish goods, but they also managed to plot the course of the river and learn the ins and outs of the area around it. But then, after this voyage, Drake was back on his mother's ship. It was anchored at the Cabo Cativa, near that northern town of Nombre de Dios. Now, of course, the treasure fleet wasn't there, but Drake had left most of his crew on board and on land to spy on the town of Nombre de Dios, learn the ins and outs of the village and her defenses. After dropping off his share of goods back at his mothership, Drake was out just a couple of days later on his galley, looking for new Spanish prizes. It was in late February that he attacked a Spanish trading frigate. The Spanish account records a group of men armed to the teeth led by two men wearing war paint, one black and one red, and they were said to be highly menacing. While the English attempted to take the vessel, they injured a number of men and women and were recorded to have killed four people on board. The only name we have was a nobleman named Diego Azevedo, who was said to have taken, quote, an arrow through the brows. But the Spanish fought back, and the attempt to take the vessel was unsuccessful. However, when the Spanish cut their anchor cable and ran, they almost immediately ran aground. So the Spanish abandoned ship and waded to shore, where they ran away into the wilderness. The English, of course, looted their ship, and then, when another ship happened along this scene, they took that ship and began to loot it as well. When they were done, Drake left the Spanish a message. This message was translated into Spanish and handed down through posterity. It really shows the audacity of Francis Drake, better than anything up to this point had. It reads, quote, Captain and others of this ship, we are surprised that you ran from us in that fashion, and later refused to come to talk to us under our flag of truce, knowing us, and having seen evidence a few days past that we do ill to no one under our flag of truce. We only wished to speak to you, and, since you will not come courteously to talk with us, without evil or damage, you will find your frigate spoiled by your own fault, and to any who courteously may come to talk with us, we will do no harm under our flag, and whoever does not come will bear the blame." And do not think that we were afraid of those ships, nor of others. By the help of God, it shall cost them their lives before they prevail over us. Now you have proof that it would have been better had you come to talk with us. For in the frigate you had not the value of four silver reels. Done by the English, who are well disposed, if there be no cause to the contrary. If there be cause, we will be devils rather than men. End quote. Drake and his English pirates then headed back to their mothership, where they unloaded all of the loot that they had stolen from these two frigates. They immediately headed back to the river Cargase, where they headed back upriver and then attacked a warehouse 
The warehouse was at a small town called the Venta de Cruces, which literally translates to the Crossroads Warehouse, and they stole there goods worth an estimated 100,000 pesos. On their voyage back to the Caribbean Sea at the mouth of the Rio Carges, they took three Spanish vessels, looted them, and then sank them. These English and French pirates were becoming something of a real menace to the Spanish along terra firma. They were uncatchable. They would attack these Spanish ships, run away, and then hide, anchoring in any of the small bays or inlets that were too shallow for the Spanish ships to search. It was said during this time that Francis Drake owned the coast between the Rio Carges and Cartagena. The Spanish were, of course, sending out ships to search for the English, these Lutheranos, but they weren't having any luck. Part of the problem was that the locals were being ordered to launch these ships, and the locals didn't really care all that much. Drake and the French made a smart move. They weren't bothering the local Spanish colonists, the fishermen and the farmers. They were attacking ships that belonged to Spanish overlords and merchant seamen, men that the locals didn't really care much about. So these Spanish locals weren't trying all that hard to find Drake and the French. However, the English realized that they needed a base of operation. Their fleet was growing. The English had taken a number of ships, mostly because they had to have more space to hold all of the goods that they were taking from the Spanish. They couldn't all fit aboard Drake's mother ship. And they needed a defensible place that they could put these ships to anchor. They decided upon a bay at the mouth of another river in South America, the Rio de Pinas, which was about 15 leagues west of Nombre de Dios. This was a favorite hiding place of the English and the French, but they decided to make it an official base of operations. The bay's natural properties made it defensible, and then the English even built some defenses on top of that. They built a small wall around the area, and that wall even opened up into the sea with a large log across the opening to keep any unwanted ships from entering. It was well fortified with all of the guns and many of the arms that the English and the French had taken from Spanish ships. They also had their contact with the local Cameroons and some of the local natives who they could trade with for any of the goods they might need to supply this base. But even if they lost contact with the Cameroons and the natives and the trade dried up, the English could last in their new base of operation almost indefinitely. The bay was filled with fish, and the area around the bay notably populated by many, many birds, for which this new English settlement took its name. It was called Fort Pheasant, and it was from his new base that Drake began an unrelenting month-long campaign against the Spanish. He launched raid after raid, taking Spanish ships, looting them, destroying their goods, and burning the vessels. At one point, they even took a Spanish correspondence ship. That was a ship filled with letters from the Spanish New World bound for Spain. They searched it for any intelligence they might be able to find on Spanish movements in the area. They did find some, but then the rest of the letters on board, mostly just letters from people to their family back home, they dumped those into the sea. Then they stole the correspondence ship. This is kind of indicative of Drake's goals on this particular voyage. He was spending most of his time raiding, but during all of this raiding, he was mapping out the rivers of the Spanish main, he was mapping out the coastline of the Spanish main, he was gathering intelligence on all of the villages in the region, as well as, most importantly, Panama City and Nombre de Dios. He was learning Spanish military and naval secrets and testing their defenses. He had built a base, not just for himself, but for any of the English pirates that would come after him or any of their French allies. This base was to serve as the jumping-off point for any operations against the Spanish in the New World, and news of his base was spreading, and they were even building a small fleet to defend his base. This voyage was a voyage of preparation and reconnaissance. Francis Drake was almost ready. However, in June, it was time for Francis Drake to return to England. Before he was allowed to dock at Plymouth, Francis Drake was forced to wait. This voyage had not been authorized by the Queen, and Francis Drake needed assurance from the Crown that the Crown could not be held accountable for his actions. He also needed to deliver the news of his profits. Drake had stolen an estimated 250,000 pesos worth of goods. In England, that would have been 100,000 pounds. Converted into modern American dollars, that would be about 23.2 pounds 
million. And he was just getting started. But the situation in England was getting worse. Francis Drake learned that, in part due to his actions, although there were many other factors, war with Spain was upon them. It was undeclared, but war was happening. Francis Drake realized that his actions in the Americas had really been something of an American theater of war against the Spanish, and he had acted unofficially as an English general in the Anglo-Spanish War. Drake almost immediately sent two ships back to Fort Pheasant to continue his campaign. The two captains aboard these ships were named James Rounce and John Garrett, and he intended to meet them after a short break back in England. While he was in England, Drake acquired a new ship, the Pasco, of 40 tons, from John Hawkins. It appears that the Hawkins brothers and Francis Drake had somewhat buried the hatchet. Both of the Hawkins brothers, as well as both of the Winter brothers, were investors in this new voyage. Drake was going to command this ship, the Pasco, while his brother John was going to command the Swan. They built three new pinnaces. Those are very small vessels. They were to be constructed at Fort Pheasant and carried aboard the Swan. These were going to be three better, swifter, and faster vessels for raiding these Spanish ships. On board these two vessels of Francis Drake were 73 men. All but one of these men were under the age of 30. This was going to be an extraordinarily young voyage. And then, after his small break and a bit of preparation... Francis Drake set sail again on May 25th, 1572, from Plymouth back to the Spanish Main. It was a quick voyage. They arrived on July 12th. After a short stop in the Antilles and Dominica, they returned to Fort Pheasant. However, they found it abandoned. All they saw was a wisp of smoke coming from the fort. Going ashore to investigate, they found a smoldering campfire, no people to be seen, and an iron plaque affixed to a tree. It read, quote, Captain Drake, if you fortune to come to this port, make haste away, for the Spaniards which you had with you here the last year have betrayed this place and taken away all that you left here. I departed from hence this present 7th of July, 1572. Your very loving friend, John Garrett. End quote. That was a mere five days before Drake landed. Drake decided to ignore the warning, however. He was going to wait, and he needed a place to construct the three ships that he had brought with him. It was only three days later when sails appeared on the horizon. Drake ordered his men to their ships and to their battle stations to defend Fort Pheasant. But they were able to relax. They saw that these ships flew the flag of St. George. They were friendly English vessels who knew about Fort Pheasant. When they landed, it turned out to be Captain James Rounce. He was one of the men that Drake had sent ahead of him to Fort Pheasant. Captain Rounce had been around for much of this story. When the hurricane had hit the voyage of John Hawkins, he was the captain of the William and John. He had been the man who took the correspondence ship on Drake's last voyage, and it appeared that things were not as dire for the English as they thought. His friends, Captain Rounce and Captain Garrett, were both alive. Captain Rounce had just recently taken a Spanish vessel. On board were a number of slaves that Captain Rounce had taken with him. These slaves had a lot of information about current Spanish movements back on terra firma, as well as the Spanish treasure fleet and the gold. It seems that Drake had changed his views on slavery since his voyages with John Hawkins. He may never have approved, but we don't really know about his feelings back in those days. However, now he ordered these slaves freed and cared for. It could have been an emotional change for Drake. Perhaps he identified more with these slaves who were poor, downtrodden, wretched souls than he did with the Spanish overlords and the English overlords over him. That doesn't seem too likely, though. It could have been a religious change of heart for Drake. After all, the voyages that he had gone on that were slaving voyages with both John Lovell and John Hawkins had each ended in a disaster. It's possible that this may have displeased the Lord, since after he had stopped slaving and begun his personal war with the Spanish Catholics, well, God very much appeared Protestant. Or maybe it was just practical and political. He was, after all, allied with the Cameroons. And holding escaped slaves or keeping them in bondage is not likely something that the Cameroons would appreciate. Regardless, Drake is quoting that he did intend to, quote, use these Negroes well, 
Now, in Elizabethan English, this might mean that he meant to treat them well, or it might mean that he means to make use of their knowledge. Either way, they were freed, cared for, and questioned about their knowledge of Spanish activities. The captains, Captain Drake and Captain Rounce, began planning their next move. First, they took an inventory of the arms that they had with them, and it was actually a pretty impressive array. They had, quote, six targets, six fire pikes, twelve pikes, twenty-four muskets and calaviers, sixteen bows and six partisans, two drums and two trumpets, end quote. For a relatively small expedition, that's an impressive blend of both infantry weapons, firearms, and explosives. The targets are really shields, that's what they were called at the time, and fire pikes, while they sound super cool, are really just pikes that can double as torches at night. But the drums and trumpets, those are telling. This wasn't just any normal raid. Francis Drake was marching to war. Drake and Rounce, with their three ships and their four pinnaces, sailed to Nombre de Dios. Nombre de Dios was a small town. It had virtually no defenses. For most of the year, it had no military presence at all, and no fort overlooking the bay. There were only a hundred or so homes and a warehouse. Drake, however, called this place, Nombre de Dios, the treasure house of the world. The plan was to row across the bay at night and wait until dawn. The men in their small boats stayed close to the shore and in the shadows. Francis Drake knew that the plan was somewhat flawed, however. He knew that if he forced the men to wait to do battle all the way until dawn, they might lose their nerve. Luckily for him, at about three in the morning, the clouds parted, and a bright, full moon filled the night with light. Drake saw this as a sign from God that the time had come. When the clouds parted and there was more light to see by, Drake realized that there was a small wine ship in the harbor, and the wine ship had actually seen Drake and his men. The wine ship was sending a boat ashore to warn the people that there were pirates in the area. However, Drake was able to intercept them and send their boat off to an island offshore where they were no longer going to be any trouble. So Drake and his men debarked and advanced into town. The very first thing they did was take control of a single gun battery that defended the town without incident. There was only one guard manning the guns, and when he saw the English approaching, he ran away to sound the alarm. So Drake split his men into three teams. His brother took one group, and another man named John Oxenham took the other. They were to circle both left and right, while Francis Drake was to take the largest group directly through the center of town. The man who had been manning the guns had run through town, screaming. He had reached the church and began to ring the bell. It was then that Drake ordered his drummers to keep time. They marched toward the city square. His trumpet sounded, announcing the coming of Francis Drake like he was a general or an emperor. The women and children of Nombre de Dios fled before them. The men rallied before the doors of the church and the local treasure house, holding the square against Drake and his men. The church bell continued to sound. The drums continued to beat, and the trumpets continued to blare. Drake's men held their fire pikes alight, lighting their way, and then the Spanish militia fired. One round hit a trumpeter and killed him instantly. Another hit Francis Drake in the leg. The rest hit the ground in front of them harmlessly. Francis Drake smiled and ordered his men forward. The English fired their muskets and their bows. Then, simultaneously, John Drake, Francis's brother, and John Oxenham arrived at the square from either side and opened fire on the militia trying to hold the town square. The few Spaniards who were left alive from the hail of arrows and crossbow bolts and musket shot broke ranks and they fled. Drake had taken Nombre de Dios with the loss of one trumpeter. Now that they had the town, things become a little bit muddy. There are two different fashions in which the looting of Nombre de Dios, the treasure house of the world, is told. The first goes as follows. After taking the town square, Drake questions a Spaniard they had captured to find the governor's house. When they arrive at the governor's house, they find a single lit candle, and at the top of the stairs, quote, 
a fair genet ready saddled either for the governor himself or some other of his household to carry it after him by means of this light we saw a huge heap of silver in that nether room being a pile of bars of silver of as near as we could guess seventy foot in length and ten foot of breadth and twelve foot in height piled up against the wall each bar was between thirty-five and forty pound in weight at the sight hereof our captain commanded straightly that none of us should touch a bar of silver but stand upon our weapons because the town was full of people and there was in the king's treasure house near the water side more gold and jewels than all of our four pinnaces could carry which we would presently set some in hand to break open End quote. as they left the governor's house a young slave rushed to meet drake and his men begging to become one of them he had heard news at the name of francis drake and he wanted to join at that moment the heavens opened and a torrential downpour began they waited for it to pass and drake continued to bleed from the wound in his leg when they reached the door of the treasure house drake fell to his knees collapsing from the loss of blood he ordered his men to enter the treasure house but they decided that they loved their captain more than spanish gold and to save his life they carried him back to his ship the spanish gold could wait now there are a couple of problems with this account of the story first nombre de dios did not have a governor's house or a governor secondly to imagine any pirate or any sailor or really any person at all abandoning the riches of the king of spain's treasure house in favor of one captain well that kind of stretches the imagination for me and what's perhaps most important and worth noting is that that story wasn't told until 50 years later. The reality is that the storehouse at the treasure house of the world was empty. Either the African slaves that they had questioned back at Fort Pheasant had been incorrect, or they had lied to the Spanish, telling them what they wanted to hear to save their own lives, which is a likely possibility. When the Spanish had knocked down the doors, they had found the treasure house empty. Later, they concocted this story to make it a much more heroic tale, but the reality is that they were forced to leave empty-handed in the rain. They did, of course, take the wine ship in the harbor. The fleet sailed to Bastimentos Island. It was called the Island of Victuals because it had large fields of pineapple and bananas and guanabana, and the soldiers needed to regroup. Captain Rounce decided to leave the fleet, he saw in Drake an indecisive and ineffective leader. He also may have feared the Spanish reprisals for Drake's actions, which was probably a smart thing to fear. The Spanish were, understandably, outraged and terrified. They realized that a small group of English pirates had sailed boldly into the harbor, unopposed of the place where all of the gold to be sent to the King of Spain was housed. Luckily, it wasn't housed there at the time, but they realized how easy it would have been for Francis Drake to have stolen all of that gold and silver. So the Spanish governor in the region sent orders to every town and every harbor to double their defenses, not only on land, but on water. Drake realized that he needed a new plan, so he sent for his allies in the Cameroons. One of the escaped slaves that he had befriended was a man named Diego. Now, sometimes that's described as one of the slaves that Captain Rounce had freed. Other times, Diego is thought to be the slave that ran up and begged to join Captain Drake and his men. Either way, he became a trusted and befriended member of their group. He was the man that helped set up and mediate the meeting between the Cameroons and Captain Drake. The Cameroons knew the Isthmus of Panama. They knew every trail every hiding place, and every village. This was their home. They also watched twice a year when all the Spanish gold and silver crossed their home on the backs of a train of mules. So they hatched a plan that when that train came again to transport Philip of Spain's treasure, Drake, along with his Plymouth lads, and a company of escaped and hunted slaves were going to steal it. But because they had missed the treasure fleet this time, that was still five months away. Drake sent some of his men back to Fort Pheasant. A few other men he set to watch the town of Nombre de Dios from a small outpost that he set up there. Then Drake himself decided to do what he did best, which was get on board a ship and harass the Spanish 
It was almost a repeat of his month-long campaign on his previous voyage, taking any Spanish ship he came across, sacking it, taking whatever he wanted, and sometimes burning it. There was one ship that was thought to be too large for his men to take. But, much like on his last voyage, he attacked it, was repelled, but then the ship ran aground. However, this time, when Francis Drake attempted to board and loot the ship, he found waiting for him a contingent of Spanish-mounted soldiers waiting for him, and they were forced to retreat. Francis Drake never did find out what was aboard that vessel that might have been so important that it had that many well-armed Spanish troops aboard it. This time his campaign lasted two whole months raiding around the Caribbean, doing as he pleased. Even for a small period of time, he blocked the port of Cartagena, not allowing any ships in or out until his demands were met. And somehow, Francis Drake always escaped unscathed. But back home at his base at Fort Pheasant, things weren't going so well. There was a Spanish attack that had seen his younger brother John killed. Shortly after that, there was an outbreak of disease that killed something around 28 men. It's thought that this disease was yellow fever. One of the men killed was Francis Drake's other brother, Joseph. After Joseph died, Francis Drake ordered the surgeon of the group to do an autopsy. They didn't know how dangerous yellow fever was at the time, or what was killing all of these men. And of course, the surgeon was infected as well, and died shortly thereafter. So the only man that had any medical knowledge at all died off. This was a tremendous blow to the English. But Drake rallied his men. His true strongest trait was that he was able to inspire those around him, even when times were at their darkest. It was around this time that the name Francis Drake begins to appear more and more frequently in the Spanish records. Before that, he had always been a footnote in the voyages of John Hawkins. But now, it was his name that the Spanish were recording as the most notorious pirate in the New World. He was an evil Lutherano, a danger to their empire, and they called him El Drake, the dragon. And then, with his forces depleted but their spirits high, a group of Cameroon messengers arrived at Fort Pheasant. The Spanish treasure fleet had arrived at Panama. A group of about 17 Englishmen and somewhere in the realm of 30 Cameroons entered the jungles of Panama. The English were heavily burdened. They all carried weapons and were wearing armor. Well, the Cameroons really did the yeoman's work of this voyage. They knew all the trails and all the paths. They scouted the way ahead, and they helped carry the English when things became too hard on them. The jungle was not a place that the English were very comfortable. It was filled with anacondas, spiders, mosquitoes, swamps, and heat. They did, at one point, have the pleasure of visiting a Cameroon village, where they found a well-built, well-dressed, and prosperous community. This was far from the assumptions that the English had of what these Cameroons lived like. But then, one day as they neared the city of Panama, the man guiding the voyage, a man named Pedro, a leader of the Cameroons, gestured toward a tree for Drake to climb. In the tree, he found a small stand, a place where he could rest, and he looked north, where he could see the Caribbean Sea. Turning his head, looking south, he could see the Pacific Ocean. Drake later said that he, quote, besought Almighty God of his goodness to give him life and leave to sail once again on an English ship in that sea, End quote. But then the night of the ambush arrived. They waited in a copse of mangrove along the road. Late into the night, they waited in silence. Then they heard hoofsteps on the road. One English soldier stood, ready to attack, but he saw only a lone horseman. The Spanish scout rode back, alerting the Spanish. The English ambush was foiled. They had to think on their feet, so they took a small Spanish village. They attacked, but they killed as few people as possible. The only people killed were a very few who in the defense of their homes, admittedly, attacked the English first. And Drake issued a message that every woman in town was to remain inviolate. He actually went from door to door, assuring every woman in every home that they were not going to be raped while the English were there. And while these reports might sound ridiculous, they actually come from the Spanish themselves. They said that Drake and his men were respectful and courteous, at least as far as invaders go. 
but this was just a ruse. They had no desire to attack Spanish villages in the area. They just attacked the village, stole a few valuables in the hopes that the Spanish would believe that they had looted the town, taken what they could, and left the area. They had to wait for the Spanish to lower their guard again, and to all agree amongst themselves that the English had left the area. The months that followed were even less pleasant for the English. They were hot and awful, and they hated the jungle. However, they met a very well-connected and a very respected Huguenot pirate. He was a French corsair who was greatly feared, named Guillaume Le Testu. They decided to join forces with this French pirate. The two captains, Drake and Testu, knew of each other. They had heard of each other's exploits, but they had never met before. However, in the time that they were together, apparently they grew fairly close. They already respected each other, but really they began to admire each other as men of honor and conviction. Once again, it was a combined force of English, French, and Cameroon men who were going to march into the jungle and steal Spanish goods. This time, they waited closer to Nombre de Dios, where, when the train arrived, it wouldn't be as fresh as it was close to Panama City. The men would be weary from their trek through the jungle, and their guard would be lowered because they were reaching their destination. It took a full two months of waiting, but finally, the Spanish sent their mule team across the Isthmus of Panama, and then the pirates attacked. The assault was not one to be remembered. It was quick. The Spanish soldiers were all barefoot, hungry, tired, and weary. They were ready to be done. The first casualty of the battle was the French pirate himself, Le Testu. He was shot in the belly from the very first volley of Spanish rifle fire. But the Spanish quickly broke ranks and ran. Once again, we see in Francis Drake, a man who is determined and yet thinks primarily of himself. Much in the same way that he had left John Hawkins behind, he left his companion, Testu, behind, bleeding to death. And again, Francis Drake defended his actions, saying that Le Testu had told him to take the gold and silver and leave him there so that he could defend both the English and the French, stopping the Spanish in their tracks, which is likely a bunch of propaganda and nonsense. However, the English, the French, and the Spanish had made a way with all of the gold and the silver on the backs of the mule train bound for the Spanish treasure fleet. The total taken equaled somewhere in the realm of 200,000 pesos. This was about 23 and a quarter million today. This, in addition to any other prizes taken in the past few months on the Spanish New World, was one of the greatest prizes ever won by any pirate in the Caribbean. They split what they had taken on this one day between the English, the Cameroon, and the French equally. It was time, after months of waiting, for Drake and his Plymouth lads to sail back to England. There was a bit of drama getting to their ship. There were several Spanish ships waiting in the harbor. However, as Drake was waiting, thinking that perhaps they had been found out, the Spanish ships left the harbor and Drake was able to build a few fairly rickety rafts where he could get his gold and his men out to his ships, which were in hiding. Now, Drake didn't take all of the gold and silver that he had won. He was only able to carry so much of it, so he took the most valuable jewels and the gold, and then the silver he buried strategically, thinking that he would be able to come back and find it. However, it was well known and passed down from man to man that Drake was never able to come back and reclaim all of this silver. And this passed down from sailor to sailor, generation to generation, would go on to form the basis of all of our myths, both for the pirates in the golden age of piracy and in any stories told today of buried treasure. And it was said that Drake did even make maps of where he buried his treasure and X always marked the spot. Drake's voyage back to England was relatively painless. It was a very quick voyage. It only took him about 23 days. And on August 9th, 1573, Francis Drake returned to England. The legend goes that when Francis Drake sailed into the harbor, word spread of his arrival. Most of the men and women in town were in St. Andrew's Church, filling the pews. But they began to whisper, and the whisper turned into a murmur. And then people began to rise from their seats, and one by one, 
started to leave. Slowly, at first, but faster and faster, until there was a torrent of people leaving the church, until, finally, they had left their pastor all alone, preaching to an empty room. All of the people in town had left to go to the docks to welcome home Francis Drake, their new national hero. Things in England were getting worse. The war with Spain was taking its toll. However, England had several victories to hang its hat upon. Next week, we're not yet going to go into this conflict with Spain. We're going to stay with Francis Drake. After returning to England as a national hero, he spends a little time basking in the glory. But then, he is called by Queen Elizabeth into a private meeting. This is something that's relatively unheard of. She even sent her royal guards out of the room because no one besides Queen Elizabeth herself and the newly knighted Sir Francis Drake were to hear what she had to say to him. Whatever she said to him in that room, we'll never know. Francis Drake was sworn to secrecy. However, shortly thereafter, he set sail on the voyage of his life, a voyage that would make him a household name in England to this very day, a national hero to the English and Spain's most wanted criminal, and the reason that schoolchildren all across the world, even today, know the name of Sir Francis Drake. If you're enjoying the show, why not check out our website at piratehistorypodcast.com. Over there, you can find some supplemental information, such as maps and works of art relating to our topics. We also have, on every episode, a list of the sources used. If you're interested in learning more about any of the topics that we cover, those source lists also have links that go to the abooks.com page for that book, where you can pick up a copy of anything you'd like to read more about. If you do use that service, abooks is kind enough to throw me a couple of bucks. We also have an abooks search bar at the website. If you'd like to support the show, there are several ways you can do so at the website. There's a PayPal donate button, as well as a link to our Patreon page. That's going to patreon.com slash piratehistorypodcast. There's also an ABooks and Amazon search bar, so if you need to search for anything on either ABooks or amazon.com, if you do so through the website, they're kind enough to throw me a couple of bucks. In addition to any of that, you can also leave a review on either iTunes, Stitcher, or Podbean, all of which we have links for at the website. Doing this really helps get the podcast noticed, and we really appreciate it. Once again, and most importantly, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.